Court on the Field of 68 Network. We are so pleased to have Kevin McGuff, the head coach at The Ohio State University, joining us for a great conversation today. Coach, thank you so much for your time. Ah, thanks for having me on today. It's going to be great. I love this so much. And, you know, I've known you for a long time over the course of your career. You know, you were at Xavier for nine seasons and then went on to Washington for a couple of years before heading to Columbus in 2013. But take us back before that, because I remember some photos of you in high school where you were getting it in and you were a baller in high school. Where did your love of the game come from? during that time of your life? Yeah, you know, I started playing at a very young age and, and I, I was fortunate enough to have a, a pretty good high school career. And um, one of the ironic things about being at the Ohio State University is we won the state championship my senior year on campus here in Columbus. Yes. So that was pretty cool. Uh, and then I went on, I played basketball at Division II school, St. Joseph's College in Indiana. And, and, you know, it was no frills back then in Division II, but I just loved playing. And so I was really fortunate to get an education and to, you know, to be able to play basketball. And that kind of jump-started my, obviously, my career, too. Absolutely. So, so take us back to your senior year when you won that state championship. And that game was close, right? Wasn't that like a down-to-the-wire situation? Yeah, really close game. And, um, you know, we play now at the Schottenstein Center, but back then it was St. John Arena which is really historic and it's a great building. We still have it on campus. And so um, I always, and I love playing there with our team now, which we do probably about once a year. And right. so um, that's been really great memories for me to be able to play there where I won a state championship. No question. So do you ever, I mean, I know when your team plays there, obviously you're going to walk through the doors and you're going to be in the gym, but on a lunch break, do you ever go in and just kind of take in the atmosphere and reminisce a little bit or is that just not what you do <laughs> no nah, it's not really what I do but I do every time I walk in there if we're going to practice or play there I do think about winning the state championship and how special it was and, and it takes me back you know pretty quickly and so it, it's a it's a really cool thing to, to be able to do and to be at Ohio State to be able to do that absolutely and then you know take us through your coaching journey what really got you into that side of the game. I know you said you'd love to play or at a D2 school in Indiana, but what was it that kind of turned the corner for you career-wise to get into coaching? You know, it was really interesting because I had no idea what I wanted to do when I graduated from college. I really did. not I was clueless. And so I was, I came back close to home at Miami of Ohio and I had a graduate assistantship doing marketing and promotions in the athletic department. And through the course of that, I got to know the women's coach there and just so happened after my first year and I was right when I was graduating from grad school, she had a job open and she asked me to come out and just to see if I would want to do it or I would enjoy the profession. So I did it for a year way back then they had what they called the, the third assistant, yes. restrict earnings and all that stuff. And so I did that for one year and then I was really fortunate we had somebody move on so I moved up to like a full time assistance job. And I did that for three years at Miami of Ohio and then was very fortunate. I got a great break where I got a chance to go on to Notre Dame at that point and work with Muffet. And my career kind of took off from there. Right. And it took off indeed. What are the philosophies that you have learned over the years, especially from a story coach like Muffet McGraw at, at Notre Dame? What kinds of things did you pick up and what kinds of things do you still initiate with your current team at Ohio State? Yeah, I mean, it was a, just an amazing opportunity to work and, and learn um, with Muffet. And she's just a great person, first of all. Um, but I think that probably the biggest thing I really picked up from her is, you know, I, everybody can learn the X's and O's and the player development and scouting and all these things. Right. But I think what really separates coaches and programs is kind of how you run the program. Right. And that's what Muffet was so good at. She was so organized, so detail oriented. Um, she had the staff on the same page and she had us on the same page with the players and, and everything that we did and how we coached and how we recruited. And, and I didn't really have a good sense of that before I worked for her. And I was just, you know, really made it about basketball, but really it's about how you run the program and, and just your, your sense of organization. And, and I would say over the years, the best coaches in our game have been the people who have run the program the best. 
And, and Muffet did that so, so well. And I don't think I ever have come close to doing it like she did it, but I, I take a lot of the, the things that, that she did in terms of the organization and have applied it to every job that I've ever had. And then, and of course, you know, put my own personality to it, my own spin on it. Um, but a lot of the things we do from a, from a program standpoint that I really learned from Muffet. I love that so much. And when you slid over from the assistant coaching seat to the head coaching seat, how daunting was that, or was it, during your first season at Xavier? It's really, um, it's, a, it's a huge adjustment and a big challenge. And, and really, it's one of those things where uh, you can really, you can be as prepared as possible. It's still going to be an adjustment, and there's still going to be a lot of things that until you go through them and you're the head coach, you're not going to really know. Mm -hmm. I would liken it to this, and you're going to get this, Chris. You're going to really like this analogy, Christy. <laughs> Okay. You know, like before you had children and you were an aunt, yeah. uh, you said, hey, boy, I really get kids and I really understand this and I'm ready for it. Right. But before you, until you were a mother, you really didn't get it, did you? Nope. I sure you didn't. Really didn't. <laughs> same thing. You're an assistant coach. You think you know, you think you're ready, but until right. you actually do it, you're, you're really not going to understand the difficulties and what it's going to really take. You're right. I love that analogy so much. Three kids over here. You have six. So you yeah. get it as well in terms yeah. of that. But you have such a great rise there at Xavier, you know, deep runs into the tournament conference titles over and over again and, and found success. So the confidence must have been exuding from you and then moved on to Washington for a couple of seasons. What was that evolution like for you in terms of that coaching confidence as the head coach? You know, first of all, I would tell you, I was very fortunate that I got a great job. Yeah. Uh, my first job was an excellent job. And I'll, I'll give you a great story. This, I think you'll really like this. Um, so through the course, when I was at Miami of Ohio, I'll go back to that. Um, Thad Mata was an assistant coach on the men's side. Okay. So we became really good friends. Mm -hmm. And so when then at the time, the Xavier job, well, I'll go back. I was an assistant coach at Notre Dame. Right. And we were actually in um, Italy, Lake Como, Italy, on a foreign tour when the Melanie Balcom was a coach at Xavier. She took the Vanderbilt job. Yeah. And so I literally, I was in my room in Lake Como, Italy at two in the morning and my phone rang. And I thought, oh my God, one of our players did something really bad and we're going to have to fix it. Of course, as a coach, that's the first thing you think, right? So I was like, what am I? So I pick up the phone and it's Thad Mata. And he had, he had called my parents' house and said, Hey, I know Kevin's on a trip um, to Italy with Notre Dame. Do you, is there any chance you happen to have know where he is? And they were like, yeah, he actually sent us the itinerary before he left. He, he's at this hotel in Lake Como and Thad called me and he said, Hey, this job just opened. I think you'd be great. And I'm going to, I'm going to walk in the AD's office. I'm going to tell him that, you're the guy. And, but I want you to email as soon as you can, um, your resume and all that. So the next morning I went to back then, you know, it was, it was internet and stuff wasn't the same. So I'd go to internet cafe in Europe, emailed them said, Hey, I'm really interested. I'm in Europe. Now, when I get back, I'd love to talk to you. And wow. so then when I got back, I interviewed, got the job and the rest was kind of history. So that's how I got that job. Um, wow. and, um, and I actually make a joke because I came to Ohio State when Thad was here. So I've just kind of followed Thad around in my career for the most part. Um, but uh, back, back to like, so that's how I got the job. But back to your question, um, you know, it was like when I got the Xavier job, the first thing I would tell you, it's a great job. And they, they have great people there. They really value basketball. So I always kind of counsel assistant coaches and people that I know take good jobs, you know. That's true. That's not that not that jobs that aren't necessarily good right now can't be made good, but take jobs where they care. Take jobs where they're going to support basketball. They're going to support you. They're going to support yeah. the players in your program. Xavier was a great place to start. Um, it was a high enough level that we could do really well, but also a level where I could make mistakes as a first time head coach and kind of survive them. And mm -hmm. so I, I kind of I think I really learned my craft there and, and worked on it and got better. And I was significantly better when I left and when I started. Mm, I love that too. And then, you know, going to Washington, Mike Neighbors, who I know is such a fantastic X and O coach, yes. mm -hmm. 
what kinds of things did you collect from him and, and going to that program next after Xavier? Yeah, no, it was really fun. And, and um, I kind of wanted to try something different West Coast and different part of the country. And, and Washington's an excellent job. And, and that was a great opportunity for us. And um, Mike, it was really it was really good because when we got there, one of the things we sort of identified as a staff that we really needed to recruit. Um, and so I spent more time as the head coach recruiting in that first year. Um, and, and I felt confident doing that because I had Mike in this, as an assistant coach. So when I left and he could run practice, and I think it, it was really great on two fronts. One, it kind of, it, it, it bore fruit. We, we got Kelsey Plum in that class that ultimately did some really special things for that program. It also gave Mike more of an opportunity to be in the gym and, and kind of get the feel of what it's like to be a head coach. So I think that we got a great recruiting class because we, we put my time where it needed to be and it allowed Mike to really prepare himself. And he knocked it out of the park when I left and he got the job. Right, right. And wow, Kelsey Plum, you know, the lefty Kelsey Plum, you had another Kelsey Mitchell lefty, you know, both in the WNBA now. Um, but with that, when you have players like Kelsey Plum out there, and you're recruiting, like as the head coach, how important was that for you to be the one walking in the gym to recruit her talk to her coaches, meet her family and, and get to know her. Like how important was that as your role as the head coach? It was really important and because at the time, you know, the job was open because they weren't doing great. And so we, were, we didn't have like a, this winning program at the time. And so we had to do something different if we were going to be able to get her. And we felt like just putting myself out there as the, the primary person, the point person recruiting her maybe right. would kind of separate us from the other people. And, and to her credit, she was she really bought into our vision of we're going to build something really special here and we're going to build it around you. And, um, you know, a lot of kids kind of like the idea of that, but they also get a little nervous because you're not winning at a high level at that particular time. But but she really took on the challenge to try to turn this program around and turning into something special and it, and it certainly obviously happened. Yeah, no doubt. And, you know, a, a major player in the WNBA with the Las Vegas Aces coming off an injury, but she looks great in the workout clips that yeah. I see from her. So it must be fun for you to continue to keep track of a player like Kelsey Plum, but also when you turn the page and got the Ohio state job in 2013, it was a very young team that you had that year, but you all made some noise, especially in the Big Ten tournament, knocking off number one seed Penn State, scoring 99 points in that game, I believe. <laughs> I just got up and down the floor. What was it about Ohio State that was intriguing after leaving Washington? But then how was that to come into a program that had super young players and make the noise that you did in the postseason run? Yeah, you know, I I really liked it at Washington and Matt, there weren't very many places that I would have left, but Ohio state's really special to me having grown up in state. And uh, that's always been a special place to me. And so I was really intrigued about the opportunity to come here and, and try to do something special. And um, so made the move and we inherited some really good kids and they just, they hadn't quite had the success. They were, they had a great run here prior to me coming here. They just, at the end, just, weren't having the success that they normally had, but we had really good kids. And, and that first year was fun and it was, it was difficult. It was a little tough in the beginning to kind of get going, but we played really well at the end of the year mm -hmm. and, and had a good run there. And, and then we were able to, to recruit some good kids and, and, you know, take it to another level. So um, it was fun. Like I said, I, I came here because I really believe in this place and I believe how special it is. Mm. And that's, that's the mark of great coaching. When you see the improvement going this way, as opposed to this way towards the end of the year. So building on the success that you had after your first season at Ohio State, uh, getting the players uh, like a uh, Kelsey Mitchell, like a uh, Stephanie Mavunga, you know, who are both in the WNBA right now as well. But when you have those game changing student athletes, I mean, Kelsey Mitchell, the only four time all American at Ohio State and Stephanie Mavunga, who was uh, an amazing student athlete coming out of uh, the state of Indiana and then coming to Ohio State. And those two were just so dynamic during that era. What was that ride like with them, especially in their junior and senior years? Yeah, great kids uh, who love the game. And 
it was a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed coaching both of them in, in that whole group. And we had a lot of talent and it was good because, you know, like your alma mater, Maryland was really good. We had some, some great rivalry games with them and it was a fun time in the big 10 because the big 10 has gotten so good. And, um, but I, I love coaching those kids. I mean, Kelsey Mitchell's is, dynamic as and exciting as players I've ever been around and probably ever seen. And she just can score the ball so naturally. And, and she's such a hard worker, just relentless. You got to kick her out of the gym or else she'll, she'll wear her body down. And, and Stephanie is, is such a fun loving kid with a great personality uh, who can really play. And she, she was fun to coach. So I, I really liked that time and love those kids having them here and, and was really fortunate to be able to coach them. No question. And that was so much fun to cover them and to see all of what they were able to do over the course of their fantastic careers there at Ohio State. But now, you know, just going back to kind of what I was alluding to with Kelsey Plum, just being in the WNBA and, and those two also being in the WNBA, what do you think has changed for the student athletes that you have had over the years with regards to the WNBA being a, a goal of theirs? Like these kids coming through now, they have only known the WNBA to be there. How has that changed the way, not really how you have recruited them, but also how you coach them up and prepare them for that next level of professional basketball? Yeah, great question. I think uh, it starts in recruiting. One, I think, you know, we recruit a lot of players that uh, at least have a goal of playing in the WNBA. So our ability to um, lay out our plan for them and how we can help them develop on and off the court and put them in a position to potentially do that one day is a big part of the recruiting process now. Um, and then when you get them here, then putting that plan into action and giving them a chance to do that, it has certainly changed the way that is like, you know, Back when I was an assistant coach at Notre Dame, we didn't have the WNBA. It was about, you know, like, hey, we're going we're gonna to try to win and we're going to help you develop, of course. But it was a lot about the academics and all these other things and what right. kind of job we might be able to get you. And, and it's still about that. And that stuff's still incredibly important. But now this component about playing professionally and, and for the, the young women that recruit to have the opportunity to, to make a living out of it is exciting. Um, but it just has changed the recruiting and then kind of how you – develop them. So I, I, I think that uh, programs that really develop their players and give them a chance to play at the next level, that's, that's certainly a huge selling point in recruiting now. Mm -hmm. And the platform that the WNBA has had, especially this past summer, with regards to social injustice, uh, you have six children, uh, you and your wife both, I know, I saw you were very creative over the uh, pandemic being home. You had a lot of activities for your kids, but I'm sure there were discussions with your six children about the things that the WNBA and the NBA stood up for over the summer. What was that like for you? And also knowing that you had Ohio State alums who were very vocal with that same message of unity over the course of that time as well. Yeah, I thought the WNBA did an absolutely amazing job in just using their platform to um, shed light on some of the injustices around the country and the things that um, especially minority communities are dealing with. And um, I was also proud of our players because they've really stepped up and, and they've you know really let their voice be heard. And um, as it relates to our household, yeah, you know, we have a unique situation. My wife's African-American, obviously. So we have mixed children who, um, you know, we want to certainly educate them on, on what's going on and, and, and help them find their own voice. And so they can and help them form their own opinions and thoughts and, and can be mindful of that. And especially, you know, I have my two oldest children are in high school and they, they start to, to, to feel that and sense what's going on in the world. And, and, um, and so we just want them to be mindful and, and to be educated. And so they can form their own opinions so that we have had those discussions and it's been important. And, uh, and it's sometimes scary, quite frankly, to have children growing up in this world. And um, you know, I, my oldest daughter drives now and you know, she were to get pulled over and just those things that we have to have those discussions. And mm -hmm. um, I'll be even more nervous probably when my son gets older and he, my oldest son, I have two sons, but so we certainly have those discussions. And, um, and then on a separate note with the pandemic, our kids have been at home most of the year. My wife's been like the teacher. And so it's been a really busy time. And, um, but you know, like everybody, we're making it. Right. And what is the age range? 
oldest the youngest? Our oldest is 17, our youngest is seven. Oh, we. <laughs> That's a busy house. That's don't, ask, don't, ask me to, don't ask me to give every specific age because sometimes no. I get a little off. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I mean, it's six babies, man. Oh my goodness, that, that's a busy house. But with that being said, I know that your your older two daughters are quite the ball players. I've seen some, yeah. some highlights and some numbers on them. What is what is that dynamic like? Obviously, being a, a college coach and the recruiting. What what has that been like, or what do you anticipate that becoming? Yeah, it's been good. Um... You know, my oldest is a senior and she's being recruited. She, she didn't sign early. Um, we thought maybe even though it's a pandemic, it's a weird year, we should have some better options late. And that's happening because she's having a really good season. So she's got some really cool opportunities. So we're excited about her to kind of figure out what she's going to do next year. And then our next one is having a really good year too. So it's been fun. I mean, it's such a fine line because, you know, obviously <laughs> I have strong opinions when I watch them play and, and, and my wife even stronger because, you know, my wife was a college player at Notre Dame and we coached together. So she's very, um, she's, she's very well versed in it as well. And so we, we have opinions and, you know, we're very hard on them in terms of our expectations of, of how they play and, and how they, how they improve and, and how much they put into it, if they're going to do it. Um, so sometimes they probably want us to be more parents than coaches. Right. Um, and I'm sure you deal with that too. Right. I'm, I'm sure it, fine line so we're, we're trying to walk that fine line where we really support them and you know remind them how much we love them but we also want to be really hard on them because you know I I see it when when parents aren't hard on their kids or, or really steer them in the right direction I, I see what can happen I see it in AAU and high school all the time in my profession and we certainly don't want that to be our children so we're tough on them uh, but we also are really enjoying getting a chance to see them play and it's really fun to see them play on the same team right now too. Oh, I bet. I bet. And, and you said that your wife played at Notre Dame and, you know, she has her own opinions at home. So when you're at home and you're discussing hoops with your older two daughters in particular, what role do you take in that conversation? Are you the head coach in that conversation? Or are you the assistant coach? Is your wife the head coach in that situation? Or how does that, how does that work? She probably, I, I you know, I chime in, but she has really strong opinions on it, you know, and like we met in coaching. She was, she got hired 10 days before I did at Notre Dame. So we both coached at Notre Dame together. Nice. Matter of fact, I, I'll tell you this, you'll like this, Christy. I, this is my story. She probably has a different story, but so when I went on my interview at Notre Dame, I went up from Miami, Ohio. I showed up. The first thing I did, you know, Muffet took me to dinner and actually Letitia was with her. And okay. so they took me to dinner, you know, the next day interview came back, got the job. Now I always tell people that after dinner, Letitia told Muffet, we got to hire this guy. <laughs> now she could have a completely different story, but that's my story. And I'm sticking with it. I gotta so ask. we actually met, we, the, the way we met, we shared an office. Uh, so back then we, we didn't have separate offices. And right. So we shared an office. So when I started there, but anyway, so she, she was a great coach in her own right. And she, she really does a great job kind of mentoring the kids, especially because I'm so busy and not around as much as she is, but she's on top of that. I love that. I love that. And you're right. Again, I do love that story. That's so perfect. And I will catch up with Letitia and ask her uh, what her story yeah. is about how that went down at that yeah. time. Right. Uh, flipping forward to uh, current times and going through the year that we all have been through and, and the year of, of pivoting and the year of being resilient. What has that done for you as a coach and a father? to stretch the way you see things and how has it changed your perspective on everyday life? Yeah, it's been, <laughs> it's been crazy. And, um, you know, it's just, I was nervous about like, just like team chemistry and stuff like that, because, you know, we, in years past, we do so many things that naturally allow them to get together and spend time together and you kind of build up that, that chemistry and communication and, and all that type of stuff. So I was nervous about that, but our kids have done a great job. They do a great job keeping in touch with each other. They did a good job in the summer and all that when we weren't together. Um, and we have really good kids right now. I think that's the, probably the thing I've learned is like, man, if you're ever, when the pandemic hits, you're going to hope you have good kids in the program because things are going to be so different and, and they're going to have to be resilient and, and they have been. And so I guess that's the first thing I'd say. I'm really thankful that we have great great players in our program and um 
other than that, it's like, like we're on zoom right now. And I, I never heard of zoom and just so many things. I wonder moving forward, is recruiting going to be different? Is it going to be more zooms and less home visits? Are we going to watch more streaming of AAU events than going to them? So I, I kind of wonder about some of this stuff moving forward. Um, I mean, we're, we're never we're going to have a big 10 meeting in person. I wouldn't think stuff like that, you know, yeah. all the things we used to do. I think, I think we're going to come out of this in, in a different space, some good, some bad, maybe, I don't know, but um, I do think it's going to be different. And how has fatherhood helped you in coaching? Well, I just think that obviously I'm coaching somebody else's daughter and, and I coach them like I would want my daughter to be coached. Um, and sometimes kids might not like that, but I would tell you, I want, I would want someone to care enough to discipline them, uh, to hold them accountable, to have a plan to help her develop as a young woman, as a student and as a player. And that's sometimes a very difficult process. Um, but the same thing I want for my daughter when she goes to college, I would do for the same thing for somebody here. Um, now, sometimes our kids don't like that because that can be like, we can be hard on them. Um, but I believe in that. And I believe if, if I'm not, if our players aren't calling their parents at times and saying, Hey, coach, we've got some real pain in the ass, then I'm probably not doing my job because kids need to be pushed out of their comfort zone. Everybody does. I did when I was a kid, yeah. you did, everybody does. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think fatherhood has helped me from that perspective of, of I'm going to really push them and challenge them to help them be the person they're capable of being. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I think they will, if they don't understand it now, I always say that they're going to understand it later. And the Correct. sooner the better, the sooner the better, because it, you know, life is hard on you, you know, so right. it's easy and it's a great preparation for that. If you had one way to describe your program and the philosophy that you want everyone to know Ohio State stands for, what would that be? Well, that would be that just that we're trying to be the very best at helping young women develop as young women, as students and as basketball players. And if we do that, I think the results on the court are going to take care of themselves. Mm, I love that too. And coach, you know, the, the postseason isn't there for your team this year, but the regular season title is up for grabs in the big 10 this year. There's been, I think not enough talk about the five ranked teams in the top 25 in the big 10. I think that it's understated. What's your take on the overall picture of what big 10 women's basketball is and has been again this season in terms of its balanced success? Yeah, I think it's just like the depth of our league. It is so hard every night. Every game is tough. We have great coaching every, every night. I feel like you're playing against somebody extremely prepared. They're great players. It's just like I look around some of the other leagues and, and they have nights, the best teams where it's going to be an easy, easy game or something. There are no easy games in the Big Ten, none. And it's just so competitive and so tough. And I think it's a credit to the coaches and, and just the commitment to, from all the schools to women's basketball. And first of all, you guys are coming off of a great win over Purdue, 100 to 85. And I, I mentioned, you know, years back in 2013, it was like a 99 to 84 score. So you guys like to get up and down. It's an exciting brand of hoops. And I know we've discussed this as well. You, you tap into, you know, some WNBA, NBA schemes on the offensive side of a player like Dorka Juhas this season, a junior who has 32 double doubles, which is best for any junior at the division one level. When you have players like that, how does that help you get creative with how to set them up, knowing that they're going to be drawing some different defensive schemes night in and night out? Yeah, Dork is a great example of a player who's got great versatility. She can score around the basket. Uh, she can score at the three-point line. She's worked really hard to develop her perimeter skills. Just And so then we try to use her accordingly with that versatility. We'll have her on the perimeter. We'll run some stuff to get her around the basket, just depending upon who's guarding her. And, and she's done a great job. And she's really worked hard on her game. I'm really proud of where she's at right now. A great balance that your team has this year. So much fun to watch. I hope I get another game of yours soon because it's just so exciting to, to watch the style of, of basketball that you play the game with. And you have a, a very uh, calm demeanor on the sideline and I'm trying to adopt that as well as a coach and that's hard for me but uh it's really fun to to watch you and learn from you and 
and cheer your team on always. And we certainly appreciate your time today on Christie's Court on the Field of 68 Network. Uh, Coach, I hope I, I see you sooner than later, whether it be Zoom or in the gym somewhere. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. This is a fun conversation and all the best to you. Thank you, Kevin.